So in this last module, since we're talking about the writing process, I want to make sure to just give a few last tips for the very final draft before you send something off to your editor, before you send something off uh, to be peer reviewed. There's a little checklist you ought to go through on that very final draft. Once you've revised it and the, and the prose is sounding good, there's a few other things that I want to make sure that you think about and check. So my little checklist for the final draft. You got to check for consistency and in particular for numerical consistency. You also want to check and make sure that your references are not what I call references to nowhere. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So those are the kinds of things that are kind of at a high level that you want to make sure you've, you've checked off your list before you send something out. So checking for consistency just means make sure that you don't have things that are totally contradictory in different parts of the manuscript. And, and this happens often. I was recently editing somebody. Uh, somebody's work and in the method section they said we followed participants for a minimum of two years and then later on I went over to the results section and I read the average follow-up time was 1.5 years so I was going huh if every participant was followed for more than two years how could the average be 1.5 years it didn't make any sense so they probably had an incorrect word choice there they didn't mean a minimum of two years they actually were the, their goal was two years so that was a little inconsistency so try to pick up on those because reviewers will look at those and, and with with great you know it, it raises a lot of questions or a lot of red flags even more importantly well, I think it's more important because I often focus on the statistics and the numbers in papers, is make sure that you check for numerical consistency. So um, do the numbers in your abstract match the numbers in the rest of the paper? And I put that one up first because it's a frequent thing that I see in papers I'm reviewing or even in papers that are actually published in the literature that sometimes for some reason uh, the abstract numbers don't end up matching things in the rest of the paper. And I don't know why that's such a frequent occurrence. I think it's possibly that people write the abstracts first for like a presentation before the data analysis is really final. And then they end up cutting and pasting that abstract in and they forget to change all the numbers. Or maybe there's a cutting and pasting error just from going from the tables and figures in the text to the abstract. Or I don't know why it is, but there, there seems to be often a lot of inconsistencies there. Um, I've seen many examples also uh, where the numbers in the text don't match exactly the numbers in the tables and the figures. So for example, I was doing a statistical review of a paper just this week and I got very confused because I read the numbers in the text and then I went to table two where they told me to go and the authors had basically subtracted column one from column two to come up with the numbers in the text. They'd just done a subtraction. Well, I subtracted those two numbers and I didn't get the numbers that they had in the text. I didn't get anything close. So it was like, huh, well, I, I'm totally confused here. And then even uh, worse, they calculated percentages also from table two and, and they came up with totally different percentages than I did. So since it's simple arithmetic, I'm thinking that they use different numbers to calculate the figures in the text than they did for the tables and figures. And that raises a big red flag. Why are those numbers, why don't they match? Um, and then I've also seen the case where some numbers in one uh, table or figure don't match this, what's supposed to be similar numbers in another table or figure. So the very common case of that is that you'll have some numbers in a table and then somebody will also present those numbers in a graphic. And if I kind of look at the graphic and try to figure out the exact values in the graphic, and then I look at those numbers in the table, those often don't match. So again, it raises all sorts of red flags, and I don't know exactly why these kinds of things happen. It might just be human error. It might be that people are using different uh, iterations of the data set. But all of those things raise real red flags for a reviewer, especially uh, a statistical reviewer. So you want to make sure that you're consistent uh, throughout your paper and that those things match. And then the final thing to think about is your references. And you want to find out and kind of make sure you pay attention to whether or not you have what I call references to nowhere. And these are references that when you go to the reference, so if you're reading the paper and then you go to the reference to try to find the information that the authors indicate is available in that reference, in fact, it turns out that that information is not there. And I have to tell you that I do a lot of this for various reasons. I end up wanting to get the information from the original source. And I go back from a reference uh, from a paper I'm reading. I go back to the paper they've indicated is the citation. And it's more often than not the case that the reference does not, in fact, provide the indicated information or fact that what the authors are saying in their paper it provides. So this is the rule, not the exception. 
So you should know that so that you don't end up accidentally citing somebody's mistaken citation. So there's a number of reasons this might happen. So oftentimes authors will sort of misinterpret or exaggerate the findings from the original source. If you go back to the original reference, it turns out that they were selective in the information that they chose to cite in their paper. Or they're, they're referencing a, a paper to back up a particular statement. And that statement is not exactly supported by the original reference. It might be supported in some roundabout way, but not directly. So oftentimes those sources really don't back up the statement that the authors are uh, writing in their paper where they're citing uh, the, the source. Uh, another really, really common problem is that the reference that the authors have cited actually is a secondary source and it's not the primary source. I call this citation propagation and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. So um, somebody, you know, Jones et al., Smith et al. does the original study. They come up with a number, a figure, a statistic. Jones et al. cites Smith et al. Okay, now uh, Barry et al. goes to uh, give this statistic in their paper. Well, they found that statistic in Jones et al. They read it there. So they don't bother to go back to Smith et al. and get the original reference. They just reference Jones et al. Okay, well, then what happens? Well, James et al. now uh, wants to cite Barry et al. You know, reads the statistic in Barry et al. Now they say Barry et al. So now this citation, this statistic has gone through multiple, it's been propagated across the literature. And it reminds me of the game uh, Telephone that children play. So if you're not familiar with that game, that's the game where the children sit in a circle and the first person comes up with a sentence and they whisper that sentence in the ear of the next child. And then that child whispers it into the ear of the next child and so on and so forth until you go around the circle. You get to the last child and that child say, says out loud what they heard. Uh, and it's always something that's very garbled and funny that has little resemblance to what started, the statement that started uh, the whole game. And this is just what happens in the scientific literature when you propagate citations. You get, you lose important pieces of information from the original source down, down the chain. Um, and so be, pay attention to that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we'll give you an example in a minute. And then sometimes authors just miss number references. Um, a way to avoid this is if you have available to you a reference management program like EndNote. It's highly recommended that you use that because that can avoid this kind of mistakes. But I'll give you an example. Uh, a paper I was working on a few years ago, there were multiple authors in the paper. We were not using a uh, reference manager since there were multiple authors. Um, across different institutions looking at the paper. There was, the writing had some problems in it, so uh, a number of authors rewrote the paper, did some heavy editing on the paper. And in that process, a few of the references, the reference numbers got jarbled. So reference, what we were calling reference three on draft one, you know, became reference five on draft two and nobody made the correct change. So when that paper went out for review with misnumbered references, it caused all sorts of confusion among the, one of, in particular, one of the reviewers in terms of they were confused. And I initially thought that the reviewer just didn't know the literature. But actually, when I looked carefully, I finally realized, oh, the reason that the reviewer is confused is because our number, our, our references are misnumbered. And so uh, luckily we caught it. But it can happen pretty easily, especially if you're not using a, an automatic uh, reference management program. So watch out for that kind of thing, especially if multiple people have looked at the draft and edited the draft. References tend to get lost in the shuffle. Um, so, uh, so here's an example of the first kind of thing I was talking about. So you, uh, some authors give a reference to back up a statement. You go to the original reference and it just doesn't back up the statement. So here's an example. I'm going to pick on a particular example from something I was reading lately, uh, but again, these authors are by no means the only ones who do this. This is very, very common. So I read this sentence. These data are particularly dis uh, disturbing as the UVC emission is even larger than ambient sunlight on a mountain. Now I was writing about this for the lay public and so I thought, well great, here I've got a comparison that anybody can understand at the amount of UVC if you're exposed to sunlight on a mountain. Well, that's a great way to put this in my piece. So I wanted to get more information about this. I thought that was an interesting and cute fact, a good fact to use for uh, a piece for the lay public. Uh, and I also had a question because when they say it's larger than ambient sunlight on a mountain, they didn't give any time frame. So is it larger than the amount that you would get in one minute? Is it larger than the amount that you'd get in an hour? So there was no reference point there. So I needed to go back 
to the original references to get more information. And again, I, I'm doing this often for various reasons, like uh, because maybe I'm writing about something for the lay public and I see an interesting statistic or fact that I want to trace back. All right, so if I go to reference 13, well, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a URL, it's a, it's a website link, and it was broken. So the, the link doesn't work, I get, you know, an error message. It does bring me to a site. So I search on that site, and there's no relevant information about UVC emissions on a mountain on that site that I can find. Maybe I didn't do a great search. So maybe, you know, the URL got link up broken, you know, between the time the authors wrote the paper and... Uh, the time it was sent, uh, it was published. Could have happened, but anyway, it's a problem because, again, I'm not able to trace that reference. All right, so I said, well, oh, good. They gave two references, so I have hope here. So I went to reference 14, pulled up uh, the paper. It was a paper. Scanned through the paper, did a search on the paper. It did not contain the words ambient sunlight, the word mountain, or the word UVC. Uh, and I didn't do UVC light even. I just did UVC. So there was no mention of any of those things in that paper. So it was a reference to nowhere because what the authors were giving me as their backup for uh, that statement, it just didn't exist, at least not in those references. So I wasn't able to ever get that information because uh, it wasn't at least where the authors told me it was. So that's an example of references to nowhere. And again, I think this happens a lot. So you know, if you can avoid it in your own writing, hopefully by doing a good pre-writing step by carefully organizing your information before you start and keeping your, you know, that information with the references early on, you won't make these kinds of mistakes where you just have references that don't actually back up what you're saying. And then finally, this citation propagation uh, concept, that, like telephone I was, I was saying before. This is one of my pet peeves, and so I just want to point out an example of this and caution you to avoid citing secondary sources. So uh, when I was a graduate student, I worked on uh, something called female athlete triad. And one of the components of that triad was something we called disordered eating, which itself is kind of poorly defined. But uh, in any case, a part of the triad is disordered eating. So people would always want to say, well, how common is disordered eating in female athletes? And at the time that I was a graduate student and writing up papers on this, the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a, uh, a hallmark statistic that everybody cited. It's, the statistic was that 15 to 62 percent of female athletes have disordered eating. And that was just, it was in every paper on female athlete triad eating disorders in athletes. It, that's just the, the one everybody gave. However, it wasn't like they all cited the same source. If you, I was trying to trace back at one point where that statistic came from, and uh, I found about 50 different attributions for where that uh, statistic came from. So one paper would cite Smith et al., another paper would cite Jones et al., and they all cited different things. Well, obviously that statistic came from somewhere. So everybody's citing secondary sources. So let me give you some examples. So this was from a paper in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. Uh, they say it has been estimated that the prevalence of disordered eating in female athletes ranges from 15% to 62%. And they give two references for that. Uh, one's a book uh, and one's a, an, ar an article. These are articles in 1996. That article is not the original reference for that statistic. That book, of course, is a review and, and also is not the original reference. So those are the citations given. But again, they're secondary sources. So notice that they referenced all the way back to, this was a paper in you know, like the early 2000s. They referenced back to 1996. The original references go back further than that, as I'm going to show you in a minute. Here's another example. There was a fact sheet on eating disorders I found on the internet. And it gave a citation. Well, that citation was also a book. So they're citing a book rather than, again, an original, uh, original source. Here's another 2000 review in um, American Family Physician. They give the statistic, although the exact prevalence of the female athlete tried is unknown. Studies have reported disordered eating behavior in 15 to 62% of female college athletes. Um, that's very specific. Female college athletes will have to evaluate whether or not that was actually where that statistic came from. Uh, they didn't even give a citation in this one. It was just so widely used and everybody just threw it around. No citation was given. Another example, a 2004 paper, they cited as the source of that statistic, Barry and Howe, 2000. Studies report between 15% and 62% of college women engage in problematic weight control behaviors. Okay, so I, I pulled uh, that citation today, Barry and Howe, uh, you know, out of curiosity and looked at the paper. It doesn't contain any mention of that statistic, so it's not even, it's definitely, is a reference to nowhere because uh, it not only is it not the original source, but it doesn't even talk about that statistic in that paper. So I don't know, you know, it might have been a misnumbered reference or something. Um, so it was, it's just all over the place. And in fact, and now if you look at the literature now in this area, I think people have finally stopped using this statistic. 
um, which is a good thing. But for a long time, it was widely used with all massive different citations, never back to the original citation. Um, interestingly, uh, as I was Googling this, I found a 1999 New York Times article, and actually they did the best, they, they got the closest to getting this right. So they said, but informal surveys suggest that 15% to 62% of female athletes are affected by disordered behavior that ranges from a preoccupation with losing weight to anorexia or bulimia. So that informal surveys is actually right on the money. So I know that some fact checker at the New York Times actually went back and found those original sources. So, um, so they did a good job. You know, a, a publication like the New York Times has a fact-checking department. Unfortunately, a lot of journals don't have fact-checking departments. So, uh, you know, these kinds of things uh, slip through. So, out of curiosity, I at one point got interested in where that statistic came from. So, I went and found the original source, and this took some digging. This took some sleuthing on my part. So, where did those statistics actually come from? So, the 15% came from a 1987 paper. The 62% came from a 1988 paper, and uh, there's a two-part, because there's actually was three papers in the series, so uh, that was something in between 15% and 62%. That came from a 1986 paper, and all of these papers had one author in common, so there was an author common to all three of those. So that's the, where the 15 to 62% came. It was, all, it was over two decades old. It was still being cited in, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008 sometimes even. So that, those references were, were two decades old. That, that statistic was two decades old. Of course, nobody ever cited the 80, the, the, the original reference. So these are really old studies. If you look carefully at the studies, they're very limited in their study design. So they're cross-sectional surveys. They don't have a non-athlete control group. So there's no control group. It's just a survey. It's self-report. Uh, where, wh what was the populations? They were, these weren't random samples of athletes. These were just convenient samples. So in one of the studies, we got a bunch of varsity athletes from um, some Midwestern universities across a whole bunch of sports. Um, so those were college athletes, but okay. Now the next one, the 1987 study, actually was 9 to 18-year-old swimmers at a swim camp. So notice that wasn't college athletes, although everybody later cited it as college athletes, just some swimmers at a swim camp. And then another was uh, also college athletes, uh, college gymnasts, just 42, though, college gymnasts from just five different teams who happened to be at an athletic conference. So these are totally non-representative samples across a wide range of athletic groups uh, with no uh, controls. And if you look at the measurement, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but if you're curious, you know, what they were calling disordered eating was you had to have done one of the following for at least once a month. Well, so for some of the sur surveys, you had to do it twice weekly. Sometimes they had fluid restriction in there. So there was really a wide range of what they were defining as uh, disordered eating. Um, and so here were the findings that uh, 1987 study found that 15% of swimmers at that swim camp used at least one of these behaviors. So that was the source of the 15%. The 19... Um, 86 paper found 32% overall used at least, you know, had this disordered eating according to their definition. And that ranged from 8% among basketball players to 74% among gymnasts. And then the 1980 study, 1988 study found that 62% of the gymnasts at the conference, you know, had this, uh, had these behaviors. So that's the source of the statistics. But yet this statistic was used as if it was the gold standard. It was used everywhere but it basically had no meaning because it came from studies that really couldn't address this very well. There's nothing inherently wrong with the studies. They were just very, very limited and they were old. So my take home message is you always want to cite and go back to the primary source. Bother to dig up that primary source. Don't trust that just because another author says the statement or the fact and gives a citation that that author has got it right because more often than not, those authors have made errors in their citing. So you don't want to just rely on somebody else. You want to dig back to the original source and actually get all the details, find out what the actual information was, and let your reader know what that actual original source was rather than doing this kind of propagating citations through the literature. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.